let's get started. Uh, first of all, let's talk about gameplay abilities and uh, what they are. So gameplay abilities is a system that uh, Epic wrote. I believe it first showed up in the engine around 4.5, 4.6, so it's been in there for a long time. But a lot of people didn't notice that it was in the engine until I believe it was 4.14 or 4.15, where they removed it from the engine and added it to a plugin. And that's when a lot of people uh, noticed that it was there, and uh, that's when I first started looking into it, which was about, about a year ago. Um, the gameplay ability system was used in Fortnite and Paragon. And um, it's, a, it's a really great system. And uh, here is the reason that you should be interested in it. So the gameplay ability system can handle client prediction. Client prediction allows the client to start performing an action before the server has authorized it. This allows for smoother looking gameplay. Gameplay abilities also handles rolling back any actions the client started performing and any events that were caused by those actions in the case where the server does not authorize the client action. Here's an example. So you have a player that casts a spell that requires 50 mana. At the time of the spell cast, the player shows it has 50 mana on the client, so the spell starts casting. The server is notified that the player wants to cast the spell, but there is a problem. The player who wants to cast the spell has a mana drain debuff. The debuff is being run on the server and has not propagated to the player's client yet. The server shows that the player has 49 mana. Therefore, the spell cannot be cast. By the time the server has figured this out, the spell has already been cast, mana has already been deducted, an enemy has already been damaged, and a buff has already been placed on the player who cast the spell. But since the server is authoritated, none of this actually happened in your world. So we need to roll back all the events that happened on the client that are related to the spell cast, while not rolling back other actions that were allowed by the server. This is all handled for you by the gameplay ability system. Uh, trying to do all of this would be a lot of code. And if you look at the gameplay ability system in C++, you see there is a lot of code. Uh, just the core of the system uh, that just handles the application and rollback is about 20,000 lines of code. And uh, probably if you add up all of them across everything, we're probably pushing 100,000 lines of code. So it's a pretty complex system. Um, it is not 100% complete. And uh, if you look in the source code, uh, Fred K from Epic actually goes through and kind of has a write-up of what was finished, what's not finished. Some things can roll back, other things can't roll back. Um, so it's it's uh, it's not 100% there, uh, but it's definitely usable. Um, in our game, Dawn of Ascension, we've been working for the past uh, eight or nine months um, using it, and um, it's definitely production ready. And obviously, they are using it in Paragon and Fortnite currently. Gameplay abilities requires you to set up some C++ to get started. Uh, but uh, if you're using the Open World Starter project, uh, it already has all that configuration set up for you. And it is in the third person character with abilities. And uh, so if you if you look at that one that has the with abilities, uh, it will have everything configured for you. Let's take a look at a few of the object types. So gameplay abilities uh, are the main thing that drive this. And uh, you can create these abilities completely in blueprints. And these uh, abilities can be bound to keys or buttons or they can be executed with a try activate ability by class blueprint node. So anywhere you can use a blueprint node, you could activate uh, one of these abilities on the character. Um, they also have a system where you can bind them to keys. And in the OWS starter project, I have some bound for you already using the one through zero keys. Um, let's see here. So. Keep in mind that gameplay abilities can be used for more than just combat abilities. Um, I use them for many non-combat related replication. We use abilities for equipping weapons and armor. We use abilities for death or unconsciousness, applying those. Um, we use them for changing the run speed and many other activities. 
at its base, a game playability is just a standard run at server RPC call pattern. So they, they can pretty much be used for any type of client to server replication you need. And they also work uh, for server initiated as well. Uh, game playabilities can be initi initiated on the client or on the server. And as you'll see later, the game playabilities have a policy setting that you can set up uh, just as a safety to make sure that if you say, hey, this is a game playability that should only get initiated on the server and somewhere in your code you try to execute it from the client, uh, it won't work and you'll get a warning. So they kind of have a safety policy built in on that. Um, the next thing that's really useful in game playabilities is gameplay tags. Uh, gameplay tags allow you to create a powerful hierarchical tag system for controlling the state of your gameplay. Uh, gameplay abilities uses this gameplay tag system throughout. Uh, keep in mind the tag system is not connected to the standard UE4 tag system in any way. It's completely separate, completely separate code files. It, it doesn't, it doesn't work with it. Um, Epic has said though that at some point they would like to replace the uh, tag system that they have in UE4 with the gameplay tags because it's a much more powerful and much better system. They they really don't like what they did with the standard UE4 tags. Uh, but as of 4.19, this hasn't happened. Uh, gameplay tags are defined in a data table. And let's take a look at that. So if you're using the ODBS starter project, you will see that there's this My Gameplay Tags table. And I already have it connected for you. There is an INI file. Um, it's either default game or default engine INI, where uh, you have to set up the link to tell it which um, data table you're using to store your tags. Tags are hierarchical and they are separated by a period. So you basically have, you know, some string dot, some string dot, and you can go as many levels as you want. Sorry about that. It looks like my my headset decided to restart. Hopefully that won't be common tonight. Um, so gameplay tags are hierarchical, and when it goes to match them, it will match anything below it in the tree. Uh, so let's see. Let's say that you have combat dot state dot magic shield is what you're trying to match. So you ask you ask the gameplay tag system. Okay, find me everything that matches combat.state.magicshield. Combat.state.magicshield.damage reduction and combat.state.magicshield.crit proof will both match. Anything that's below it matches it. Um, it that's the hierarchical nature of it. There is a special kind of game play, play tag I want to point out here. It's these ones that start with gameplay queue. Um, so it has to exactly match here. Uh, it has to say gameplay queue dot, and I believe the G and the C have to be capitalized. If you set the, your tags up using the gameplay queue dot prefix, they will be shown in this gameplay queue editor that you can access from the window menu. And what this does is allows you to set up handlers for each of these gameplay queues. They they effectively become events that can be used to run uh, gameplay queues. You can see there it took a second to go find them. Uh, every time that you start it up, it basically has to scan all of your blueprints to see which ones are hooked up. It's not statically keeping that. So when you first open it, it'll all say add new, but there's actually quite a few of them that already have handlers here. So this is a nice way to keep track of what gameplay queues are being handled based on certain gameplay queue event tags. And we'll take a look at queues a little bit later, but I wanted to mention that gameplay queue dot. There's not a lot of not a lot of documentation mentioning that special type. Okay, the next thing we want to take a look at is gameplay effects. We're going to come back later and look at all these in depth, but I just kind of wanted to go through the different pieces first. Uh, gameplay effects are used to apply modifications to character attributes. 
Now these character attributes have to be set up in a special attribute set for them to be usable. If we go here and look at the C++, you will see that I have defined an OWS attribute set where I have quite a few attributes, attributes set up for you. So I've got like health, mana, energy, fatigue, stamina, and I've set up quite a few of these. We've also got base attack, attack power, crit chance, crit multiplier. These are the only values that game playabilities can interact with. So if you have other variables on your character, they are not going to work. This is where all of the attributes have to be set up for them to be visible in the gameplay effects. And the gameplay effects is where we make changes to those attributes. Let's take a look at some fireball damage. Uh, let's see. Damage effects. Damage effect. Okay, so gameplay effects have a duration policy. It can be instant, infinite, or has duration. Uh, this, infinite, this instantly applies the damage effect. It all applies at once. And these are those attributes that were defined in that OWS attribute set. These are the only ones that will show in this dropdown and the only ones that can be modified. Um, you get a modifier operation. Here we have add. Uh, you'll notice there's not a subtract, but that's okay because if you add a negative number, it will subtract. In this magnitude calculation type, we can use a scalable float. These are fixed values, um, except that since it's scalable, you can actually use a curve table uh, to control it. So potentially if you have um, a type of spell uh, and it has different levels of the spell, or you have a spell and you have different levels of the character, uh, you can set up a curve table that basically says, okay, at level one, do this amount, at level two, do this amount, at level three, do this amount, it's just like a big spreadsheet. So scalable float can use that. You can also just punch in fixed values that don't change. Uh, attribute based allows you to do a simple calculation. You get about three modifiers that you can put a coefficient, uh, an additive, and then an outside the, coefic outside the additive coefficient. And you can do that based on any other attribute. Custom calculation, we'll take a look at later, allows you to use a blueprint to do a complex calculation that is as complex as anything you could do in a blueprint. And then in this one, we're actually using set by caller um, because in this case, this fireball damage um, is, it does damage based on the amount of time that you've powered it up. And the ability is the one that knows how long you've held the, uh, the uh, action key. And so it's going to use this gameplay tag. These are all gameplay tags. And it's going to use this set by caller tag to be able to basically send over that parameter. Um, we also have more gameplay tags we can select here. We can say, OK, um, on the source, they have to have these tags or it won't work. And on the target, you can say, OK, the target of the effect has to have these tags or it won't work. Um, there's also a section here where you can do custom uh, executions for how to calculate it. This is somewhat similar to the custom calculation class, but infinitely more powerful. Uh, those do have to be written in C++. Um, you can have conditional gameplay effects. Uh, they have a section here where you can do chance to apply to target and also um, requirements for whether it can be applied. Uh, the concept of a stack of effects is built in and you can have certain things happen when you overflow the stack. Um, you can deny overflow applications. Um, premature exp expiration effects, routine expiration effects. Uh, we'll come take a look at this later, but this is where you can set up gameplay cues uh, that are related to this effect and automatically fired. And then here is where you can have uh, tags that are connected to this effect. You can have tags that are applied to the target and you can have them added or removed on the target based on if this effect is currently on them. 
Uh, we've got ongoing tag requirements, meaning if any of these tags are lost, the effect will expire. We've got application tag requirements. If any of these um, tags don't exist, it will not apply. And you can actually have a gameplay effect remove existing tags that they already had. Um, certain tags can grant immunity to this gameplay effect. If the target has these tags, it can be immune. And then they also have stacking, which can be set to none, aggregated by source or aggregated by target. So the difference here is that if you aggregate by source, each person attacking gets their own stack on the target. If you aggregate by target, even if five different people are trying to do the same thing, the stack is uh, across all of those people. You can set um, what to do with the duration when it refreshes. Do you refresh the duration? And we have a period reset policy on the stack and an expiration policy on the stack. So they really cover a lot of uh, stack-based stuff. And gameplay abilities can also grant you other abilities. So if, or I'm sorry, gameplay effects. So if this gameplay effect is on someone, you could grant them an ability that they didn't normally have, and those can be added here. Okay, let's take a look at gameplay cues. Gameplay cues are used for showing the result of gameplay abilities on screen. These are best used for updating UI, spawning effects, and playing audio. Gameplay, acu gameplay queues do not run on the server. They only run on the client and any replicated proxy clients. Let's find a queue here. I believe these are inherited. No, they're not, so this is good. Uh, so this gameplay queue, uh, we have a, an ability. I will show it here. So we have a gather and cast system. And basically what it does is that they've now gathered this spell and you can see there's that effect on their hand while they have it. And after a certain amount of time it expires and goes away. So that is handled with a gameplay queue. This one is for lightning. That one we showed was for fire, but it's basically the same. And what this does is when it handles the gameplay queue, it checks to see for the active state It casts to our character type to get the mesh. It then finds the right hand weapon socket, which is where you were seeing that effect. And then we spawn an emitter at that location. And this one actually spins two emitters. That's a stacked effect. There's two different pieces to it that work a little differently. And so it's spawning both of those and we are keeping references to those spawned items because on remove, we want to come back and destroy those components. Now, you might be looking at this and wondering, well, how does, how does it get destroyed? After a certain amount of time, it disappeared. Uh, how did it get destroyed? That is handled by the gameplay effect that we looked at. And so let's find that effect. Look here at the lightning gathered spell effect. So you can see here, this one has duration, interesting. And you can see that the duration magnitude here is set to 10 seconds. So what happened is that the effect was added to the, to the character, and then after 10 seconds, the effect was autom automatically removed. We can use that same thing here to use scalable float, attribute-based, custom calculation class, and set by caller to set these durations, but Right now, we've got it just set to 10 seconds. If we come down to gameplay cues under display, you will see that we have gameplay cue two part spell gather dot lightning. And that is connected to cue 
that we looked at. And it is right here. Gameplay queue tag. So basically this tag is connected to the gameplay queue and the gameplay effect, and it automatically handles firing the queue on all connected clients whenever the gameplay effect is uh, active, which we'll call this, but it also will handle calling this on remove when the gameplay effect is removed. So we don't have to handle that. It's gonna handle all of that for us. And so we're able to, we're able to connect that right here using, using tags. We also throw some effects here, or some uh, tags onto the uh, target of this effect so that we know if they have a gathered spell and we can use that, um, we can query that later to see, hey, do they have a spell gathered? If they activate something to cast that spell, do they have it or not? So we're basically able to use these uh, gameplay tags to manage the state of our combat. Now let's take a look at a gameplay ability. Got one here that I had, uh, there we go, that I've commented. Okay, so on the gameplay ability, um, we also have some tags here that we can use. We have activation required or blocked tags. So this one here says, hey, if the global cooldown uh, tag is on this character, don't let them activate a spell. Uh, there are also some replication policies. This one's a little confusing because even if you have it set to do not replicate, everything still replicates. It's just that the ability itself is not replicated, only the effects of the ability. There's actually a very limited number of times where you would actually want the ability to re replicate. It's a very special case. Um, also an instancing policy. This one's important. So non-instants are static meaning there exists only one copy in the world. This is not that useful. Instance per actor are probably the ones I use most often. It basically says, hey, there's only one instance of this ability per actor. We can keep reusing it, but there's only one instance. And the reason this is nice is because then you don't have to keep recreating it, throwing it away, recreating it. However, it means that you cannot run two of these abilities at the same time which in this case is not a problem, but if it is a problem for you, there is instanced by execution. Uh, this is gonna take up a lot more resources, but if you need to run multiple abilities of the exact same type on the exact same character, you're going to need instanced per execution. I had mentioned before about that safety policy um, right here, net execution policy. This doesn't actually change anything. Like if you change this, I used to think that that changed how it worked. It doesn't, it's just a safety policy. You'll get a warning if you try to use it wrong. So local predicted um, is normally what I use when it's activated on the client. And server initiated is what I uh, use when it's activated on the server. Uh, gameplay abilities have a cost and they have a cooldown automatically built in. These are gameplay effects where you can basically charge certain resources anytime that this gameplay ability is activated. And then cooldown is a special type where you can create an effect that in this case is setting this global cooldown for a certain amount of time so that anything that has this activation blocked global cooldown tag, this cooldown down here is going to handle how long is that global cooldown for this ability. Let's go through this ability. So we have our event activate ability. Remember, this can be activated from a uh, from a bound key using the system that's built in. However, I find that it's a lot more useful to be able to use your own key bindings, and then in that case, you're going to use try activate ability by class to call this. And when you do this, is what it's going to use. Uh, first, here we want to get the selected target. So we're just grabbing um, we're just grabbing that actor, and we're getting their character, their third person player controller and uh, we're saving this this ability here is for a tab targeting type of system 
And so on the player controller, there was a selected character um, that was basically from the UI, from using your mouse to select something. That reference was saved in the selected character. So we're going to grab that, cast it to our base class OWS character, and we're going to put it in our character target. If any of these fail, this is an important thing, actually, in game playabilities. Every fail path must hit end ability. If you don't do this, the ability is just going to stay out there running, and it's going to end up getting in the way of other abilities. Um, and you're going, to have, you're going to have some problems. So every fail path in the entire system has to go to this end ability node as well as every success path as well. Uh, okay, so once we have the selected target, target we're going to do a distance check. Now, I did the distance check here, but there's actually another override function where we could have put it, and it basically is this can activate ability. So this is a override here that you can use where you can basically set up, okay, what are all of the custom criteria needed to activate this ability? Now, you don't have to handle things like cooldowns there because they're handled for you. You don't have to handle cost there because it's handled for you. Uh, but additional things, uh, I often use can activate ability. I often have code in here that says, hey, are they standing on the ground? Because this ability only works if they're standing on the ground. You can put stuff in there. I could put this check distance to target there as well. Um, but in this case, I needed this character target. So I decided to put it here rather than have to get this twice. Uh, so we're just basically going to get the actor location of the target, get our self, do a vector, check it against this max cast distance, which is right here. And uh, I'll talk about later what you can use these for that's interesting um, by having variables, because you're thinking, wait, why have a variable? It's just going to be hard coded. It would seem that way, but there's actually a use for that. And so we check, is it less than or equal? If not, we end the ability. Um, but if they are within distance, we are going to start playing an animation montage. So we can start this playing. On completed, blend out, interrupted, or cancel, it's going to end the ability. At this point, we now have gotten to the point where we're saying, OK, they've met all the requirements. It's checked the cooldown. It's checked the um, cost. And we've checked the distance. All of this has been done on the server in parallel with being done on the client. And commit ability is run. Now, what commit ability is going to do, as soon as it hits that, it is going to send a message out to the client, say, back to the client who's sitting there waiting, running, starting to run its prediction, but sitting there waiting, going, is what I'm doing going to count or is it going to get rolled back? As soon as you hit commit ability and it gets that message, it knows, hey, I can continue. I'm not getting rolled back. Everything after this point uh, is guaranteed to happen because we've already met all the requirements. So you got to be careful where you place this commit ability. Don't place it too early. Uh, because nothing can roll back after that point. And in this case, we are going to apply a gameplay effect to the target. And that effect here is the self-attack effect. And um, yeah. looks like that got disconnected at some point. And then it's going to apply that target to the selected target. You can see our character target, ability target data from actor, and we apply the effect. Here you've got these two values where you can say how many stacks it adds and the gameplay effect level. This gameplay effect level you don't have to use, but this is what can drive this is what can drive the data curve. Uh, the more I use this ability, the more I realize Paragon really influenced this. And so a lot of the terminology and a lot of the way that they did things is very much related to their uh, MOBA Paragon. Um, but I haven't run into anything yet where it's like it's not flexible to be able to use it for other types of systems. But a lot of the stuff they have added in there, you're, you can really see that, that Paragon had an influence on it. I'm guessing that's probably where it got used first. Um, so that is how a gameplay ability works. And let me go to our character, and I'll show you how it gets activated. Before you get off onto the next bit sure with the cooldowns can you do that on a curve as well uh let's take a look so if i go to my cooldowns i have a folder just for that so i've got a 100 millisecond cooldown here and we have has duration 
and you see scalable float and okay. scale float magnitude. This is where you pick your curve table and you can pick your uh, row for that curve. Yes. And so then what will happen is when we sent in that gameplay level that you saw in the ability, it will use that to determine how long this duration is using this curve table, uh, which is just a data table. And each one of these is a row. And the columns are one, two, three, four, five, six, up to whatever number you want. And so what this is doing is instead of using this time of one second, it's going and going to the table, grabbing this row that we would choose. So I pick one here and it's just a preview, but it's basically going to go and use that uh, to drive it. So yes, you can. And you'll notice many of these things, period, that can be connected to a curve table. Chance to apply to target can be connected to a curve table. And uh, there's quite a few other places as well under some of these modifiers where they can be connected to curve tables as well. So pretty much all of the things in gameplay effects can be connected to a curve table if you decide to go that route. Does that answer your question? Yep, yeah, awesome, Mike. OK, uh, let's take a look at activating an ability, which is quite simple. Let's go to our input graph. Try to find a good one here. Here we go. Um, so we have a walk run toggle. So it switches between two different speeds. And so it's going to do it once. It's going to branch based on this movement level, just an internal number we use for movement modes. And you can see here, start running, start walking. These are abilities that get activated. Um, and the great thing about this is that when this gets called, it will start running it on the client instantly. It will transfer a request up to the server to tell it to activate it. If the server gets to that commit ability and says, yes, that can be done, it will send a message back to the client that says, yep, they can do that. And at the same time, it will start that ability on every single connected proxy. So you have the owning client, which is the person that activated it, runs there. You have the server, it runs there. And then the server will also propagate that out to every other one of the proxy clients so that it gets activated there. This is important for run speed because if you've ever tried to change the run speed and not gotten your timing right with the propagation of it between server and clients, you'll get into this weird mode where the character goes into this stutter. And what's happening is that uh, for a certain period of time, the value of the walks, max walk speed on the client does ma not match the value on the server. So your character will attempt to move faster or slower. And then the server will come back and say, no, 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 that is not your walk speed, this is your walk speed, and you'll see it do this micro stutter between it. It looks horrible. I remember the first time I did it, I was like, what is going on? And uh, But by using this, that's not going to happen because it is going to handle all of the timing for you, and you won't have to worry about that. Uh, so very easy to activate with this track activate ability by class. Um, if you're using the OWS starter project, I also have some keybinds set up for you here. And they're right here, ability one through zero. And I believe weapon one and two might be left and right mouse button. And so here you can just pick the ability that you wanna be executed when those keys are pressed. You can choose to use those or not use those. And, uh, but you can always use this try activate ability any way that you wanna use it. And uh, that will call it. Um, let's see here. So we've taken a look at uh, gameplay abilities. We've taken a look at gameplay tags. We've taken a look at gameplay effects. And we've taken a look at how they can spawn gameplay cues. Last thing I want to take a look at is a gameplay event. Um, these are really powerful. A lot of your abilities will not use them. Um, but they're, they have some cool usages. So we actually use um, PhysX for our collisions. So when you're swinging that sword, 
there is a PhysX collision volume on that sword, and there's the PhysX collision volume that is uh, kind of wrapping around, it's not a hitbox, but it's kind of wrapping around the shape uh, using capsules. Uh, it's wrapping around the shape of the uh, robot mannequin. And so what's happening is the GPU is checking, uh, did those collide? The reason we found that this is important is that, and you can actually test this yourself, the uh, OWS starter project, if you use the one key to swing at that mannequin that's standing there in the corner on that first map, you'll notice about one out of 10 times, you see the sword go through them and it doesn't count as a hit. And what's happening is that the built-in collision that Epic does only checks collision once per frame. And depending on the timing, the sword is at one frame in front of it and on the next frame behind it. Therefore, it does not count as a collision. PhysX, on the other hand, is doing the entire swing and you're not going to get any missed collisions. However, that created a problem because the PhysX system is not connected to the game playability system. So what are we going to do? Here's what we did. In our event graph, the PhysX ability system is firing this weapon hit. And we are taking that data and we are creating a send gameplay event to actor. We create this gameplay tag, combat.weapon collision active, and we're sending that gameplay event. And here's where that's going to get picked up. If we go over to our melee attacks and we go to our attack template, you can see that, let's find it here we have this wait gameplay event. So what happens is we start our swing, we play our animation, and then we wait to see, did it hit anything? And if it gets to the end of the animation and didn't hit anything, okay, it's done, shut down the gameplay ability, we're done. But if that weapon hit event fires while we're waiting, it instantly allows this wait gameplay event to continue here with this event received. And you'll see combat.weaponcollisionactive matches that event that we were firing. And so by those matching, we are able to connect those two together. So you don't use web, you don't use gameplay events a lot, um, but they're great for being able to integrate with other systems in UE4 that might not be contained within the gameplay abilities. Because the gameplay ability system in itself, it's sending events internally back and forth all the time to do all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, but we've only found a few uses where we have to explicitly fire the gameplay events and this melee weapon thing using physics is a perfect use for it. And so what'll happen is uh, once it fires, it'll hit this event received. We can pull the data out of it and do all the rest of stuff that we have to do. So um, that is gameplay events. And now let's take a look at, I'd mentioned this before, one of the really cool things about gameplay abilities is that because they are classes, they can use inheritance. What this means is you can have gameplay abilities built off other gameplay abilities and not have to replicate the code. So I do that here with this attack template. And you can see that I have these variables that are on this template. And so this template never gets run. It's just the base template. And then these are all of the variables that can change how it works. So we've got things like damage type, which animation to play, and, uh, and all these other different things. And so what you can do is you can go here and you can say create child blueprint class. That will use this as the template to create another ability. Also, when you right click here and say, gameplay, create gameplay ability, it will let you pick the parent class. So if you don't want it to start from another one, you do have to find the default one, which is this one, gameplay ability. Uh, that's, the, that's the base one that doesn't do anything. But uh, you can pick from any of the other ones you've created, and it, uh, it uses inheritance, which is really nice because then it allows us to do this. So I'm going to grab one here one-handed attack thrust. And so now all of these settings I can set. Notice that it doesn't have a blueprint, right? 
I don't need to because I'm not modifying how it works. I'm just changing the variables that I send in. So I'm saying, hey, use this sort attack thrust animation. We're not using this damage type anymore because we're using um, we're using gameplay tags to handle that, so that's not used anymore. You can say, hey, which effect do we want to play? I've got some different ones that can get picked. You can say, which gameplay cue do we want to play? Is it a small impact, a medium impact, a large impact? This is controlling the effect, the sound. Uh, this is internal to our system. You can change the animation play rate. Uh, and then this was some stuff for doing uh, doing root motion um, in abilities. Um, still playing around with that. And then you can actually, I've got an extra thing here that you can activate an effect on yourself. So if you get a hit on someone, it'll automatically act, activate this effect, which could be a buff or something on yourself. Maybe it's not a buffed. And then I've got this can activate in air tag. And I can also control all of the tags related to it. So you see here, I have swing left to right. So our combat system cares about what direction you're swinging. So I've got some tags for that. Um, this ability has some requirements. Uh, you have to have a weapon equipped in the main hand. And you cannot use this web, this ability if the global cooldown is running, if you're blocking, or if you're sprinting. And then I set the cost. Uh, so it takes five fatigue. And I set the cooldown, 150 milliseconds. Uh, wait. No, it's not 150 milliseconds. It's 1.5 seconds. So being able to use inheritance allows you to, every one of these things here would have had to have all of that code duplicated in every single one of them. But because you can use inheritance, you can create abilities that are built off other abilities and really minimize the amount of code that you have to deal with if you need to go make a change. So I definitely recommend structuring your system that way. Let's see. There are some things you could do that you might not think of, such as uh, you can use effects to set your equipment. So what we did here is when you equip a piece of armor, that's going to modify your slashing resistance, your piercing resistance, potentially some other ones. And so we decided, oh, we just apply an infinite gameplay effect. Infinite means it will stay until it's removed. And then we can have gameplay abilities that add those equipment effects and remove those equipment effects. So you can use gameplay abilities for more than just straight combat actions. Um, I also have... effect, can they be linked to your items in OWS? Let's be linked to your... From your item table. Yeah, you could you could feed that in. Yes. Yep. Again, again, they're using the same methods. Uh, they're using the same methods. So what I do here, we I actually do feed them in. So I have set by caller. So if we go to the ability for this one, you'll see that I'm going and grabbing data from a data table, or you could grab data from the OWS item table, and you're pulling that into the ability when this ability activates, which the ability is equip some piece of equipment, and then you're gonna send in some name of the piece of equipment. And by doing that, you could pull some values out of a data table, pull some values out of an internal table, and uh, using the set by caller, and setting this tag, I've got slashing, and I've got piercing, and uh, these tags here control that. And then you can send those values in, and they'll stay as an infinite modifier uh, on the on the uh, on the effect stack. Uh, somebody asked if it works easily with the ARPGIS. Um, you could. So ARPG, ARPGIS has a data table. Um, I haven't looked at it too much, but it has a data table. And you could um, potentially add columns to that data table that controlled any different things like slashing resistance, piercing resistance, armor, more spell power, more whatever, any of these effects, any of these values you want to modify. And then in your ability, I'll show that real quick. This might be a bit of a mess, let's see. I cleaned it up some. So I got this get data table row from the armor table. Uh, so this could be your 
ARPGIS inventory table possibly, and you send in the row name, oops, you get the values from it, and then you pass these in, slashing, piercing, blunt, metal armor factor, armor weight. Um, this is an old system here where it had a data name. I don't recommend using this anymore. Um, instead, and I think in the in the new version, I think they've removed it completely. Uh, instead, use the tag version. So it has a sign set by color magnitude and it has a sign tag set by color magnitude. You always want to use this one here. Um, this one is going to um, this one is going to work better, and it allows you to set up these set by color tags to control all of those pieces of data. And it'll make sure you can't accidentally mistype one of these and it not work. Um, these don't do anything. These were for testing. They're all coming from this data table row now. So you can definitely do that. So equipment, you wouldn't even think that that's an area that you can use for abilities, but you can. Let's find some other interesting one here. Combat states. So I have one for applying death. Death is a gameplay tag. So one of the things you start to realize when you break down gameplay abilities is you realize gameplay abilities are good for doing two things. They can apply effects and they can apply tags. And tags are state. So gameplay abilities can be used to change the state of your game by applying a tag. So this applies the dead tag, exhausted tag, permadead. I don't think we're using that one. Uh, I've got um, our game, the combat changes if someone's standing in water. So in this test here, got this water volume. Walking into this will run this gameplay of effect, apply standing in water. Um, and I've got another one, apply wet. And uh, there's some different gameplay tags that control the state there that then can be used when we apply damage to be able to modify how much damage. So I think in our system, if you're wet, which I think lasts for 30 seconds after you've walked through, it might do, you know, 5% more damage. I believe that uh, if you're standing in water and you get hit with an electrical effect, it's 100% crit chance, right? So you can do, you can create all these complex uh, gameplay systems and have it handle it all for you. Uh, here's the start running, start sprinting, start walking, stop sprinting. And again, these are just, uh, these are just states that you want to change. Yeah, but by using a gameplay ability, you make sure that the states get changed uniformly across your client, uh, or in this case, most of these fire from the server. So it'll fire on the server to change the state, and then it'll make sure that the owning client gets updated and all the proxy clients. Uh, so gameplay abilities are a very good way to enforce server authoritative combat, which you always want to do. Never, ever do anything on the client. The client should be a dumb terminal where you press a key, it picks up the key, sends it to the server, the server decides what to do, and it sends it uh, back to the client. You don't want to have the uh, don't want to have the client doing doing anything outside these gameplay abilities. It's perfectly okay for the gameplay abilities to use client prediction because they're inside the rollback. But you definitely don't want to do anything in your character on the client, check any values on the client, ask any questions about can they activate something on the client. Your game will be super easy to cheat. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, but we'll take a look at that curve. Actually, that was not. These are for these are curves for something else. I was going to take a look at that um, DOA. Yeah, so that curve table. You had asked about this, Smarte. So this is all it is. You just have a row. Each row is a curve, and you have some values, and then it uses uh, when you apply that gameplay effect you're sending in that effect level. It uses the effect level to go find the column. It uses the row we selected to find the row, finds the number, and that's the one it uses. So this this part is very much related to Paragon. If you think, if you've played Paragon and you think about the way that the abilities level up, um, it's very much tied to that. You don't have to use it. Um, we're actually not using it a lot. I prefer actually to do a lot of the calculations with math, but if you want to have tables control it, this is a great, uh, a great way to do it. Let's see if there's anything else I missed here. This was our armor and weapon tables. There's that water volume. That's 
we looked at that. So we're changing weapons. Dodge abilities. We have our costs and our cooldowns. That's that's pretty much the uh, pretty much the basics of the system. Um, it's it's really powerful. Unfortunately, by being flexible, it's a little intimidating at first because you have to, like even if you just wanted to do something super similar, super simple, you would have to. Okay, we have to create an ability. We have to create an effect. We have to create a queue. We have to create some gameplay tags. You know, just to do something simple. But by them doing that, I have not run into anything, any kind of ability I could think of um, that it can't do. I'll, I'll show a few, uh, a few of the abilities that we're doing here, just so you can see some of the things that can be done. Let's take a look at the caster abilities first. That's fine. Um, so we have an ability here, uh, Fireball, and I'm going to be holding the activation key. And the amount of time I hold it powers it up. And then I'm using the mouse button to aim and fire. So those are actually two different abilities. One of them handles the um, gathering of the spell, and then another one handles the casting of it. Um, we've got another one here. So I've got a cast bar. That cast bar is a gameplay queue. A gameplay queue can run that cast bar for you. And uh, this one creates a tornado effect. And you can see it kind of levitates my character. Oh, and I also have some fall down mechanics. If you uh, and the fall down is also handled by uh, gameplay cues as well. And uh, let's take a look at some of the ones on the melee character. This is just changing my ability sets. And I've got this shield one, right? So it's creating some kind of shield for a certain amount of time. Just applying a gameplay effect, applying a gameplay cue boosting some kind of stat or something on the character or adding a gameplay tag that'll affect some other ability we'll look at um, like there's one that makes you crit proof and so that puts on a crit proof tag when it goes to do the crit processing it says well you know if they have crit proof don't even roll that chance and let's see i have one here this one uh it really just halves the gravity we call it upward draft but it kind of just uh, it's like some kind of wind effect and it just uh, changes the, the character movement to half gravity. Kind of simple. Plays this gameplay a cue of this upward effect. I think that was an effect from Infinity Blade. Here's one that's fun. Uh, so I'm going to hold down the activation key. And based on the amount of time that I hold it down, I'm going to decide how far we jump. And so uh, a gameplay cue, uh, what, or I'm sorry, a gameplay ability was handling that. Uh, there's an automatic thing built in to check how long a key was held. Um, there's those wait tasks uh, in the abilities, and there was one that says wait activation key time. And you get a time value out of the end of it, and then I took that time value, did some math, and figured out the launch vector. One of the fun things here is we can combine half gravity with launching for a really big launch effect. Uh, again, everything works together because they all use the same gameplay effect system, so you don't have issues about okay, what gameplay effects need to be applied first, you know, what things are based on other things, because we're all using the same system, everything works together nicely, and you end up with a coherent system. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anything else you'd like to see? Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for attending. And um, if you're interested in playing around with the um, open world starter kit, which has all of the C++ already configured for you, and you can jump right into doing the same stuff here in Blueprints that uh, that I've been showing you today, uh, it uh, I will. Uh... Warp Rabbit has a question, I think. Okay. Let's see. Someone on chat here is asking a question.
just waiting on a question here in chat. Okay, I have a point-based system with 100 points. Okay, so they're using a 100-point system to adjust things like range or cone. Okay, so um, maybe for spells or something, you can change the range or like is it a cone, is it an area of effect attack, something like that. And the end result is converted to damage output. Buffs multiply the end result. Okay, so... Um, if we go back to gameplay effects, let's see, let me find one here. Um, so you're able to base these effect modifiers off of other attributes. So you can go to this modifier magnitude and it says attribute based. And so you can go in here and you can have a backing attribute. So you can basically have different um, attributes affect other effects that happen. So I think you're going to want to set up some attributes to track things like your point system or any buffs that might multiply the end result. You're going to want to set those up as numbers that can be tracked through stacked effects and then use those in say your damage effect or whatever else is getting modified using this backing attribute system. Does that make sense? So I think you could do that without doing anything custom depending on how many, um, you see here it's got these modifiers and you can do, you can do multiple um, but at some point, depending on the math you need to do, you potentially might not be able to use this attribute based and you may have to use a custom calculation class. And so if you need that, you'll have to create a blueprint class. Um, now, this is one system where the base gameplay ability system does not allow you to do custom calculations in blueprints. But I wrote a special blueprint for you called OWS Mod Magnitude Calculation. And this lets blueprints do this. So you can create a blueprint inherited from this OWS mod magnitude calculation uh, to be able to do calculations. I've got one here for fatigue, magnitude, self-heal, health calculations, where you can use blueprints to do any kind of calculation you want. Um, but again, if you're using the stock gameplay ability system and not my version of it, you, you won't be able to do this. This won't exist. And you'll have to write your C plus, you'll have to use C plus plus to write your custom calculation classes. But um, if you inherit from this OWS mod magnitude calculation, you can do your calculations in that. I can go grab one of these. I don't think any of these actually work, but we can take a look at how they look. Um, let's see. I have a calculation folder. And where's that you wrote it? Yes, so I wrote a C++ class here called, I wrote quite a few. So um, some of these weight tasks that you use, they, they just weren't working very well. And so I've made modifications to the weight target data, uh, weight for overlap, weight cast time is a custom one I wrote for using, because um, lots of games use uh, cast bars. So this is a weight cast bar control that I wrote. Um, I've got one for waiting for an attribute change threshold. So in an ability, you can say, okay, stop at this point in the ability and wait for some stat to reach a level or drop below a level or a threshold. Um, and then I made some changes to the network sync point ones, kind of an advanced topic, but there's ways where you can say, complete this part of the ability up until the point 
that the client and the server become in sync and then continue the rest of it. And so I've got this one here, ability task network sync point. Um, the weight target data, though, is the one I probably made most of the changes to. Uh, this one is useful for, let's say that you want to start an ability and then you want it to bring up an AOE targeting that you can move around with your mouse. And uh, so this has options to allow you to do all that built in. Um, Epic had one, but it didn't allow you to move your mouse around. It only allowed you to aim your character. So again, it's probably just based on what they needed for Fortnite and Paragon. But I wanted more of a RTS type feel where you can actually like move your cursor around. I was actually just copying like um, uh, a mage in WoW that uh, uses Blizzard, I think it is. They get a little thing they can move around and I was just copying that. that it seems that my headset has restarted again. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> I also wrote this one here, OWS mod magnitude calculation. So this just exposes functionality that Epic had in their system, but it exposes it to Blueprint so that you can write a mod magnitude calculation in Blueprint and you don't have to write it in C++. That's all it does. And so that'll be in, if you have the OWS starter project, you've got, uh, you've got those things there and then um, World Radical and target, act, target Actor underscore P. I always forget what that P is supposed to be. I ran into the max name allowed. It wouldn't allow anything longer, but uh, it's related to the to the targeting actor for when you're moving your cursor around to select an area to fire AOE at. Um, there is one thing. There is one thing that, depending on how much you want to customize your game, you will have to write a little bit of C++. Um, so I, in the OWS Starter Project, I set up a generic, what I call, damage path. It's very similar to like World of Warcraft. So if you're going with something like that, it's probably going to work for you. There's a lot of options where you can customize it, things you don't have to use. However, if you want to customize your damage path, you will have to edit this OWS attribute set or inherit from it and edit your own there are two methods you want to be interested in. The first one is called pre-gameplay effect execute. This fires every time that an effect is about to be executed, but before it happens. It allows you to do things with this damage property, which is a transient property, and it allows you to check for tags, uh, gameplay state. So I can have different things happen if I'm falling, if I'm exhausted, I can have it roll dodge chance, um, I've got different damage types do things differently. And basically it says every time that it would be applied on the target, we're not talking about the source here, we're talking about on the target, it gets to ask some questions about the target and make modifications to the magnitude of what's about to be uh, applied. So you can do multiplication, you know, 80%, 120% uh, and check things like that. I have a basic one for you in the AWS starter project that'll handle a lot of stuff, um, but if you you have a lot of custom rules around crit chance or damage types or really want to get complicated, you might have to write a little bit of code here. It's very simple. You can probably copy and paste some of the stuff that I have and just make some changes. And then there's one other one here, which is the post gameplay effect execute. This is what actually is going to affect your final values. And so it takes this transient property and it basically allows you to apply it. So I had this transient property damage and I'm basically saying, hey, if what you want to apply is damage, then go get the instigator. Um, this is custom for me. I have a logging system that logs damage, you know, so you can have like a damage log. Um, the AI actually uses that as well. And then you're basically just saying health. OK, uh, I'm going to minus equals the amount of damage. I'm going to clamp it to zero to max health and I'm going to set the transient property back to zero. Uh, this is important because to make sure that the order of effects don't matter, it's important to make sure that you don't directly modify health or other resources. You want to modify transient properties that at the end of the frame will come and apply them all together here. So you can see I have a damage transient property for we're dealing with health. I have an energy decrease property for dealing with energy. 
I have a fatigue increase for dealing with fatigue. So there's um, there's these transient properties. Um, you don't have to have these for every type of um, attribute that you're updating, but you should use the transient properties for your resources. So resources would be where you usually think of like in RPGs where you have like a bar, right? Health bar, a mana bar, an energy bar, something like that. Uh, you're going to want to use these transient properties. You don't have to. Um, but a cool thing is that when you set up these values, you can set a policy. And that policy here, let's find one of these health ones. So here is health. And you'll see I have meta hide from modifiers. This makes sure that health doesn't show up in the dropdown uh, for your gameplay effects. So no one can accidentally choose the wrong one. And then at the bottom here, I have your damage transient. And this is the one that you can update that then will eventually get rolled up and deal with modifying the health. Um, but again, you don't need that for everything. I have fire resistance, blunt resistance, you know, reload speed, magic armor, all of these other things. They don't necessarily need that complex um, ability to be modified as they're being applied. But if you need that, this is where you're going to handle it. Um, again, you've got most of the defaults set up. You can do a lot with what's set up if you don't touch the C++ here. But if you need to, if you need to fine tune that damage path, you're going to have to do a little bit of, a little bit of C++ uh, modifications. Otherwise, everything else can be done in blueprints. And uh, one of the things you could do if you have a large team is you may decide that you want to have somebody who's good at coding blueprints to come in here and build these templates. And then you can have other level designers and people who are working on how the game works, but don't understand, you know, all the coding real well. And they can come in and inherit from those and create all of these different inherited ones just by editing settings on it. So it's a really good way to split up the work on your project between, you know, people who might understand coding a little bit more and people who just want to build out the gameplay. They understand how it's supposed to work. They just don't understand all of the uh, all of the uh, coding ideas or some of the complex math. So then they can they can just come in here and uh, and just change these effects, drop in their animations, change their damage types, how much damage, is it connected to a curve, anything else that you set up in your templates, and they could come in and build out the rest of it. So I think it's a really great way to, uh, to split up work on your team uh, efficiently. Any other questions? OK. Well, uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm in the uh, Discord chat here at Saber Dart Studios. And uh, just let me know, and I'd be happy to help. Thanks, guys.